This past week, I was reading through a book titled Spiritual Emotions by Robert Roberts, in which he had this famous image that's going to be projected above me. I wonder how many of you have seen this picture. There it is. It's a famous picture because you can look at it in one of two ways. You can have two different perspectives on the picture. I wonder tonight, how many of you see a young lady? When you look at this picture, raise your hand. And now, how many of you see an old lady? Some of you raised your hands twice, because you're able to see both of the images. So there's a young lady depicted there from one perspective, and an old lady from another perspective. And if you don't see one or the other, I can explain how it works later, but I'm not going to take up too much time doing that right now. The point that I want to make with you tonight is that there are two perspectives when you look at the suffering of Jesus. From one vantage point, you might conclude, being familiar with the suffering of Jesus, that he is a pathetic loser. And that's exactly the conclusion that some women reached You read through the Gospels, and at one point you discover that there were women who were following Jesus, weeping and wailing, it's told in the Gospel of Luke, for example. Why were they weeping and wailing as they followed Jesus, as he staggered along carrying the cross? Well, because he looked emaciated and haggard. He was depleted of all resources. He was bleeding from the scourging. And these women wept for him. They wailed after him, as you would for a man whose business goes belly up. By all accounts, he was a man who had a mission that failed. He was a loser of sorts. I wonder tonight how you see Jesus when he's on trial before Pontius Pilate. Because from one vantage point, Jesus appears to be a powerless defendant who quietly and passively resigns his fate to Pontius Pilate, who has the power and backing of the formidable Roman Empire. But tonight I want you to open your hearts and minds to the full orb message of Scripture to see that there's something else going on here when Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate. This isn't simply a Roman trial involving a man. This is a cosmic global trial involving the Son of God. And far from being a powerless defendant, Jesus in this text is actually the true judge of the world. And in the short time that we have together tonight, we're going to see how Jesus judges Pilate, how Jesus judges Israel, and then thirdly, how Jesus judges himself and the implications of that for you and me tonight. Jesus, when he appears before Pontius Pilate, is the true judge of the world, and he judges Pilate, first of all. Now, when you read this account, what is striking about Pontius Pilate? Well, what's striking about Pontius Pilate are his multiple pronouncements of Jesus' innocence. Once before this passage, twice within this passage, Pilate says, I find no basis for a charge against him. It's in verse 4, it's in verse 6. I find this man innocent. I find no reason to hold him guilty. And yet you and I, if we're familiar with this passage, know that uh, Pilate is hardly a neutral or objective judge. At the beginning of the passage, he has Jesus flogged, scourged, whipped with a belt that had sharp bits of bone in it that would have lacerated the skin of Jesus and caused it to bleed. His soldiers participated in the mockery of Jesus. They draped on the shoulders of Jesus this mock purple robe. They pressed into his scalp this crown of thorns. They yelled multiple times, Hail, King of the Jews! And then Pilate takes him out to the Jews and says, Here is the man. Pilate is a bully, and he bullies Jesus in this passage, but he's also bullying the Jews. The Jews say, crucify, crucify. And Pilate says, I find no basis to lay a charge against him. You crucify him. Now, Pilate understood full well that the Jews were not authorized to crucify people. And the Jews, if you read the account, they become very animated 
and they switched their argumentation from uh, political grounds to religious grounds, and they say, well, he's claimed to be the Son of God. He's guilty of blasphemy. That's a capital offense for the, for the Jews. And how does Pilate respond to that news? The text says that Pilate was very afraid. When he heard the Jews say he has claimed to be the Son of God, he was even more afraid, the text says, than he was before. And so I want you to think of these two characters that we have in this courtroom drama. We have this emaciated defendant who's sweating, who's bleeding, who's uh, haggard, who's uh, depleted of his strength. And we have this individual who has the backing of the great Roman Empire, and which of the two is afraid? Well, Pontius Pilate is shaking in his Roman boots. And he begins to interrogate Jesus, doesn't he? He says, where do you come from? And Jesus is silent. Pilate is baffled. And he says to Jesus, do you not realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says you would have no power at all unless it were given to you from above. And throughout the Gospel of John, we learn that Jesus is the one who comes from above. That is the realm from which he comes. That is the realm of his Father. And Pilate derives his authority from that realm. Pilate is a bully. And Jesus, in this sequence, judges Pilate as a bully he exposes behind the bully persona a fearful coward who uses power that isn't even his own to mistreat people. And in so doing, he judges all bullies. I wonder tonight, do we have bullies in our congregation tonight? Do we have boys and girls who bully other boys and girls on the school ground? You say, well, that wouldn't happen among Blessings, children, would it? But it does. There are bully young children. There are bully teenagers. And there are even bully adults who kind of wield the power and strength that isn't their own. We have no native strength. What we have is from God. But we use it to mistreat people. Jesus is the true judge. And he unmasks behind bully personas, fearful cowards. And he will unmask you if you are a bully, whether a child, whether an adult. Well, Jesus, in this sequence, doesn't simply judge uh, Pilate. He also judges Israel. And he says to Pilate, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. I find that quite interesting. Pilate is unwilling to pronounce anyone guilty. But Jesus here finds someone guilty. He says, the one who has handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. The Jews and the Jewish leaders. Pilate has been hesitant to hand Jesus over to the Jews. But the Jews are insistent, aren't they? They say, verse 12, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. They change the argumentation once again. They shift from a theological ground now to a political ground. And the Jews were very familiar with the, the current emperor, Tiberius. And what they knew about Tiberius is that he responded very swiftly to crimes of treason. And they say, Pontius Pilate, do you want to be seen as an opponent of Tiberius? Don't you know what will happen to you when Tiberius gets wind of this? Pilate again mocks both Jesus and the Jews. Here is your king. And the crowds respond vehemently. Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. And then what the Jews say next should send shivers down our spine. Because they say, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar. 
And so now they're not only rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, they're pledging loyalty to a foreign oppressor. And it's all the more striking when you recognize that the Jews in those days had a slogan that's of course derived from Scripture, which was, we have no king but God. And here you have an apostate parody of that. We have no king but Caesar. Jesus is the true judge here. He's judging Israel for apostasy. He's saying, beneath the veneer of piety and devotion are people who really don't love the Lord, who really aren't interested in serving Him. Jesus is the true judge. And He exposes beneath bully personas fearful cowards. And He exposes beneath the veneer of piety hypocrites. And I thought Pastor Hilmer did a great job with this a couple of weeks ago when he said, you know, you can, you can pretend to be someone you're not in front of other people, but there's no pretending before God. He sees everything. You can't hide your true character from Him. He's the all-seeing, all-knowing judge, and you will be exposed Now, perhaps you're saying tonight, I'm not so sure it was a good decision for me to come to church tonight. Because this is kind of a depressing sermon about Jesus as judge. I want to hear a sermon about Jesus as Savior. I get you. I get you. Well, I want you to see with me thirdly and lastly that Jesus doesn't only judge Pilate and the bully persona, doesn't only judge Israel and hypocrites and apostates. He also judges himself. The true judge judges himself because he puts himself in the place of sinners. As one to be executed because of their sin. It's something that the Gospel writer John doesn't want us to miss. I find it interesting that Right at the very beginning of the trial scene, and then right again at the very end of the trial scene, we read that it was the day of preparation before the Passover. It's verse 14. It was the day of preparation before the Passover. What happened on the day of preparation before Passover? It was the day when the Passover lambs were slaughtered. Now this, as I said, is not simply a Roman trial involving a man. It's a cosmic, global trial involving the Son of God. And what you notice as you read through the Gospel accounts is that Jesus from the get-go, from the very beginning of His ministry, is on trial. And what you find over the course of Jesus' ministry is that witnesses are summoned to testify in this trial. And the very first witness to be summoned to witness in this trial is John the Baptist. And what is the testimony of John the Baptist in this big cosmic trial? He says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's something that John the Gospel writer wants to reiterate. So you get Pilate saying, here is the man. Here is your king. But John the Gospel writer wants us to Recall in our minds also, here is the Lamb of God. Because when you read on later in the chapter, it's way down verse 36, I think, or something like that. You discover that when Jesus was crucified, the soldiers did not break his legs. Why did they not break his legs? To fulfill what was said of the Passover lamb, not one of his bones shall be broken. Jesus judges himself, puts himself in the place of sinners, because as Isaiah says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that Jesus, as he suffers, is carrying our sins, carrying them to the cross, in order to carry them away. And that's why the Heidelberg Catechism poses the question that it does. Why 
did Jesus have to suffer under Pontius Pilate? The catechism's answer is that though innocent, he was condemned by an earthly judge that we might be freed from the eternal judgment of God that rested on us. The Lamb of God carrying your sin, my sin, takes away the sins of the world. I want to ask you tonight, when you think of the suffering Jesus, what is your image? When you think of Jesus on trial, what is your perspective? Is Jesus the emaciated, powerless defendant who can only quietly and passively resign his fate to Pontius Pilate? Or is he, in fact, the true judge in this account who judges Pilate, who judges Israel, who puts himself in the place of judgment, the place of judgment that you and I deserve? I want to ask another question tonight. And that is, how do you see yourself? Are you a bully who needs to be exposed? Are you a hypocrite who needs to be exposed? We have a wonderful invitation that comes through in this passage. And it's the invitation to admit that we fail. To admit that we sin. And not just to admit that we sin and we break God's commands and we fall short of the glory He destined for us, but that those sins that convict us, perhaps the sins of bullying, perhaps the sins of hypocrisy, were laid on Jesus so that He might carry them to the cross and carry them away. How do you see yourself tonight? If you open your hearts and minds to Scripture, what Scripture says about you, if you're one who entrusts yourself to Jesus, you can, you ought to, see yourself as one forgiven. As one loved by God with a love too great even to imagine. As one who's precious in the sight of God and warmly embraced by Him, welcomed into His presence. I want to conclude with one more thing. You know, I mentioned that John the Baptist is the first witness called to testify in this great trial that Jesus faces. There is a sense, isn't there, in which Jesus is still on trial before the world. And we are called to witness in line with John the Baptist, not, now not before the event of Christ's death, but after the event and we are called to say to people, to say to ourselves, to say to our families, to say to people around us, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We're a missional church. This is the testimony we want to bring. But first and foremost, this is the testimony we need to believe. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the ultimate Passover lamb, to take away the sins of the world. Help us tonight to rest on him, to rely on him, to see him in this calling, in this vocation, and to trust that he is the way through which we can be accepted by you, forgiven of our sins, restored to a right relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.